As a scholar of genocide and a scholar of state crime, I do want to begin, however, by uh, declaring solidarity with the Palestinian people who are currently undergoing what I would call the annihilation phase of genocide. We heard a lot about Ukraine this morning, which is there are some similarities, certainly, in terms of an a part of a part occupation uh, and the uh, indiscriminate civilian attacks. I think what is happening in Gaza is at such an extreme level that we all need to stand up for Palestine. And, as, and because I'm here in Belgium, I want to send solidarity uh, to the Belgian transport workers who've refused to load and unload weapons going to Israel, weapons which would inevitably, inevitably have been used against the Gazan people. So free Palestine. But for the purpose of today's paper, I'm going to turn my attention now to another genocide, that of Myanmar's Rohingya. And I want to offer a brief analysis of the role of the United Nations in that genocide. The United Nations, I think, requires our particular attention in the unfolding of Myanmar's genocide, not least because of its widely attributed moral leadership in the field of human rights, clearly contestable. Like states which compose it, the UN has a sorry and rather shameful history when it comes to genocide identification, advocacy, prevention, and protection. And in this paper, I want to explore whether the UN's role in Myanmar and Myanmar's genocide against the Rohingya might actually amount to complicity in genocide. Given the time allocated, um, I am necessarily going to make some assumptions about what the audience might know about this genocide. But if you have any questions, uh, more fundamental questions about the genocide, please ask in the discussion. Despite its ostensible association with human rights, the UN as a supra-state with historic humanitarian underpinnings has approached genocide with timidity and complicity in equal measure. For many in the business of humanitarian and development aid, the UN sets a particular standard in terms of framing both human rights and their violations. But the United Nations continues to be so unwilling to call out the genocide uh, perpetrated against the Rohingya when it might have made a difference, particularly between the years of 2012 and 2015, the fact that it didn't had incalculable consequences. It ensured that the vast majority of actors within the human rights, humanitarian and development communities in turn continued their work as if the Rohingya was solely in need of humanitarian support and not in need of saving from a genocidal state. I shall argue that the UN both supported and contributed to the genocide by A, failing to challenge and expose the regime's abuses, B, by acting with complicity in the state's denial of Rohingya identity, and C, by sustaining the structural conditions of apartheid which operated inside Myanmar, and particularly in relation to the UN's sustenance of the uh, detention camps into which the Rohingya had been herded in 2012. I'll concentrate on the role of the UN operations inside Myanmar during the critical years between 2012 and 18. And my argument is based on extensive field work and from data I gathered with my team from UN field officers, um, field workers, humanitarians and Rohingya in Yangon and Rakhine State, uh, and also in the Bangladesh camps um, later. I begin with an overview, however, of UN failings. The UN Security Council ensured through its structural composition, political ideology, and organizational practice, that the genocide of the Rohingya would never be named as such, certainly during the years in which it might have made a material difference in terms of interventions to prevent. In 2018, when from the perspective of the Security Council, this unrecognized genocide was over, the Security Council conducted a formal mission to Myanmar and the Rohingya camps in Cox's Bazar. Two of the Council's most powerful states and allies of Myanmar, China and the Russian Federation, were included among the 14 delegates. In the mission's briefing to the Security Council, delegates reported witnessing the aftermath of appalling atrocities, yet the word genocide does not appear in any of the 14 delegate reports. Unsurprisingly, reports from Myanmar, the Russian Federation and China defended and even praised Myanmar's attempt to contain intercommunal 
conflict and to facilitate the return of Rohingya refugees from Bangladesh. There have only been two instances uh, of note in which UN bodies have seriously addressed the great harms of the genocide against the Rohingya. First, in March 2017, the UN Human Rights Council established an independent fact-finding mission, the kind that we heard about from Rosa this morning, to establish facts and circumstances of the alleged human rights violations by military and security forces and abuses in Myanmar. In what is a self-referential, delaying, and I think deeply limiting approach, the Human Rights Council insists that its own investigative mechanisms carry the credibility and veracity required for its imprimatur. Yet its research capabilities are limited and it relies heavily on briefings by scholars and human rights organisations who for a number of years had warned of genocide or impending genocide. Following the genocidal mass killings and expulsions of 2016 and 2017, the UN High Commissioner told the Human Rights Council in Geneva that the situation appeared to be a textbook example of ethnic cleansing, a description without the same gravitas or call to action of genocide, which was comfortably adopted by many states around the world, safe that such a designation would place no obligation on them to, to act in any way to prevent or punish. In keeping with UN protocol that only their own work has veracity, the Commissioner went on to clarify disingenuously, that the situation cannot be fully addressed yet since Myanmar has refused access to human rights investigators. Given the wealth of detailed data amassed by credible human rights organisations such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International and academic researchers and my own International State Crime Initiative, uh, this repeated mantra of a lack of data is both hollow and a means by which action can ultimately be delayed. By the time the UN Human Rights Council felt conditions for the Rohingya were at such that an investigation was warranted, the genocide had reached its final stages and UN researchers were denied access to Rakhine State and therefore were, were reliant on the existing work of scholars and human rights organisations for information relating to the state crimes that, had been, that the Rohingya had been subjected to. The report of the fact-finding mission was nonetheless a powerful indictment of the UN's failings. It concluded there was sufficient information to warrant the investigation and prosecution of senior officials in the Tatmadaw, that's the Myanmar military, chain of command, so that a competent court could determine their liability for genocide. Here was a clear implication of genocide and a call to punish perpetrators, six of whom were named in a, in a list of uh, genocidaire. Aung San Suu Kyi, however, and senior members of her government were not included in that list, were not targeted for prosecution. A regrettable but unsurprising outcome, given the veneration, albeit tarnished, that she continues to carry with certain uh, institutions. Now, over five years later, the UN has yet to issue any prosecutions or indeed impose any punitive measures against Myanmar. In a revealing observation, the fact-finding mission noted that during a period of significant international engagement in Myanmar, and while the UN was supposed to be implementing its Human Rights Upfront Action Plan, systematic and grave crimes against the Rohingya were committed. The UN, while identifying Myanmar as a crisis situation, had nonetheless failed across all its agencies to provide a human rights-driven response instead prioritising development goals, humanitarian access, and what they call quiet diplomacy. The second development of potential, albeit limited, significance was the November 2019 hearing in the International Court of Justice, in which Gambia, supported by the Organisation of Islamic Countries, filed a case alleging that Myanmar had committed the crime of genocide against the minority Rohingya, thereby violating the convention uh, on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. The following month, Gambia requested provisional measures, which were unanimously approved by the court to protect those Rohingya remaining in Myanmar from further acts of genocide. But effectively, this was simply demanding that the Myanmar regime abide by the provisions of the Genocide Convention, which it had been always under an obligation to do as a signatory to the Genocide Convention. 
So in effect, I would say that the ICJ case is of symbolic, symbolic value only. Now moving into Myanmar, under the leadership of its resident and humanitarian coordinator, Renata Lokta Salian, who was there from 2014 to 17, the UN adopted a disarmingly comfortable relationship with the Myanmar government. Influenced by the demands of the regime and a flawed analysis of the nature of Rohingya persecution, the organization's country office adopted a strategy that involved the prioritization of development over and above human rights concerns. It adopted a Rakhine nationalist appeasement approach, so matching its humanitarian aid to Rohingya with humanitarian aid to the Rakhine uh, population there. Uh, it adopted the suppression, uh, a strategy of suppressing those field officers who, wa who warned of real and potential mass violence against the Rohingya. Uh, it, um, it all the way through supported and sustained the Rohingya detention or concentration camps. And in clear deference to Aung San Suu Kyi, it adopted the prohibition of the use of the term Rohingya in internal UN documents. Dr. Salian's appointment in 2014 coincided with the massacre of Rohingya people in the village of Duchi Yatan in northern Rakhine state. Duchi Yatan was to become a real watershed moment for the suppression of human rights advocacy from the UN and humanitarians in Myanmar, following the expulsion of Médecins Sans Frontières and the subsequent chilling effect that expulsion had. They were expelled because they simply reported that they had treated the victims of this massacre. Um, and reporting on this massacre was to bring Renata Lokta Salian immediately into conflict with OCHA, the um, UN Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and Field Officer Michael Sheikh, who worked for OCHA. After presenting his report on the Duchi Yatan massacre, replete with eyewitness accounts, um, which resulted in the murder of at least 20 Rohingya and the expulsion of MSF, Sheikh's evidence was dismissed in favour of fierce but baseless. Myanmar government denials. Lokta Salian made it an immediate priority to restore relations with the regime. Michael Sheikh's experience of attempting to report on human rights abuse against the Rohingya revealed a UN effectively shackling its own staff to secure political favour from the Myanmar regime. Field staff, including Sheikh and Caroline van den Abel, were prevented from further visiting and reporting on human rights abuses in Rakhine State and deliberately excluded from important strategic meetings. Those who spoke out against the UN's relationship with the regime and the persecution of the Rohingya found themselves humiliated in meetings, their travel authorizations denied, and an atmosphere in which all discussion on the Rohingya was silenced. Lok de Salian reportedly attempted to dissuade UN Special Rapporteur Thomas Oea Quintana at the time from visiting Rakhine State in 2014. The UN was repeatedly warned by its own officers and by those it tasked to investigate its operations about the dangers of its approach in Myanmar for the Rohingya. It ignored those warnings with spectacular consequences. And the UN Secretary General, Antonio um, Guterres, had more than a part to play in protecting the Myanmar state against genocide charges. He reportedly instructed UN staff to lay low on Myanmar, while his spokesperson, Stefan Dujaric, vigorously defended Lokta Salian, declaring that she'd advocated for human rights and development in a very strong way. And on the anniversary of the August 2017 mass killings, mass rapes, mass expulsions, Guterres continued to minimise the, the genocide by describing it in a tweet as a massive influx of Rohingya people and other communities from Myanmar to Bangladesh and called on their plight not to become a forgotten crisis when he himself was contributing to that collective forgetting. But the UN was little concerned with human rights abuse and the apartheid structures which enabled the institutionalisation of those abuses. Instead, it focused on sustaining those structures of segregation, these camps that I mentioned, and funding development initiatives which, from its perspective, could be seen to benefit both Rohingya and Rakhine communities, and in so doing, appease Rakhine hostility towards the UN and INGOs. An approach which an internal UN report described as at high risk of failure 
uh, to prevent large-scale violence. The fact that Suu Kyi's government denied access to journalists and researchers wishing to travel to Northern Rakhine State in the years after 2012, and denied the UN Fact-Finding um, Commission permission to enter Myanmar in order to gather data on the genocide, illustrates the ultimate bankruptcy of the UN's self-interested appeasement approach. The Myanmar government quickly learned that it had little to fear and much to gain in terms of international relations with a compliant UN under its control. In the time remaining, I want to focus on just three examples of complicity. The 2014 Myanmar census, uh, what I call genocidal cartography, and the recurring theme of repatriation. So the census. It's worth noting the role of the UN through its UN Population Fund in facilitating Myanmar's notoriously racist $75 million 2014 census, the first held in the country since 1983, as much of our fieldwork was conducted during its preparation. It was clear from the outset that the census carried with it an insidious portent. The Rohingya classification was to be excluded and Rohingya participants would not be immunerated. Instead, they had to call themselves Bengali and Bengalis are considered illegal immigrants inside Myanmar. Exclusion from the census would also mean exclusion from political representation and recognition. In many ways, the 2014 census could be seen as an integral part of the genocidal process, an official means by which to further deny the identity of the country's Rohingya minority and exclude its political, social and economic participation. Controversial questions relating to ethnicity and race were approved by the UN Population Fund, despite human rights criticisms over the potential dangers of including them. Remember too that this census was conducted in the midst of a state-sponsored Rohingya dehumanisation campaign. Ignoring the apartheid structures underpinning the census and the social fictions that any misleading data would entrench as social facts, Janet Jackson, the UNFPA's representative in Myanmar, reported that for the first time in decades, the country will have data it needs to put roads, schools, health facilities and other essential infrastructure where people need them most. What the UNF what the UNPF willfully ignored, however, was that those excluded from the racist census would also be excluded from those roads, schools and health facilities that the data would apparently service. Moving quickly now to genocidal cartography. The erasure of place names is a standard technique adopted by genocidal regimes. Uh, it's apparent all through historic Palestine in the way that the new state of Israel eradicated any Palestinian presence it could. And so in Myanmar, following the mass killings, rapes, destruction and expulsions, um, it becomes a form of state denial and falls into the final stage of genocide, which is sometimes called symbolic enactment, the state of denial when the new society, the society which exists now without that troubling community, the, the, the community that has been um, subjected to genocide. It's a strategy normally accompanied by demographic engineering, the building of the regime's religious and, and cultural monuments to take the place of those that, that belong to the former group, the planting of forests, uh, very evident in Israel, and or, as in the case of Indin in Myanmar, the building of security establishments in the areas of Eurasia, often over destroyed Rohingya villages. With the former inhabitants annihilated or forcibly evicted, the regime symbolically and brutally asserts its absolute dominance uh, and creates conditions hostile to any possible return or repatriation. Dramatic changes to the natural and built environment of the kind that took place in Rakhine State after 2016 render a place familiar, once familiar, homeland, alien and willfully inhospitable. These changes are, are designed to actively prevent possible return. The Myanmar regime's strategy has been precisely to do this, and in many respects it has succeeded. When the UN cartographers produced three maps of Rakhine State in 2020, uh, with Rohingya village names disappeared, um, the UN was in fact, in fact endorsing Myanmar's strategy of identity erasure. Uh, Kan Cha is one of hundreds of Rohingya villages destroyed by the uh, Myanmar military in 2017, 
but it is a village alongside others um, now erased from official history, not only by the Myanmar military's brutal strategy of village destruction, but also by the UN mapmakers. And finally, I could talk about re uh, repatriation, um, because the issue of repatriation reveals a structural inclination on the part of the UN to relate or collaborate more closely with the goals of states, even the most criminal states, than with the goals of the genocide victims who might one day be repatriated. All Rohingya we interviewed in the Bangladesh camps expressed a singular desire to return to their Myanmar homeland, but only on the condition that their safety, security and citizenship were guaranteed. Um, but for the UNHCR, the willingness slash voluntariness of those to be repatriated and non refoulement claimed to be the unassailable principles underpinning repatriation were dispensed with. I could talk more about that later, but I, I realise I now have to conclude. Um, and so I will, by saying there have been at least four limited independent inquiries and a number of leaked and revealing internal UN memos prompted by the UN's abject failure inside Myanmar. Most have had very limited or no public circulation. All bar one point to a dysfunctional culture and a structural inability to prevent human rights violations and mass violence. All have been suppressed and ignored by the UN. What we take from these inquiries is that the UN systematically failed to challenge the Myanmar government on the genocidal human rights abuses which were to lead to the effective annihilation of Myanmar's Rohingya in 2017. Rather than demand the closure of the Rohingya detention camps, the UN, through its resident coordinator and agencies, uh, like the, the World Food Programme, actively contribute to their sustainability through the provision of limited food, very limited food, and limited, almost non-existent medical aid. In doing so, it has worked with the Myanmar regime to support a system of brutal apartheid in which the incarcerated Rohingya was reduced to bare life. It suppressed its critics and silenced those who advocated against the regime on behalf of the Rohingya. By elevating development at the expense of human rights and by ensuring relations with the regime were conducive to UN access, the UN effectively colluded with the regime's genocidal project. And this is not to suggest that the UN shared the genocidal intention of the Myanmar regime, not at all but that its actions and organisational goals served quite explicitly to facilitate rather than challenge the genocide. Human rights demands have been consistently overshadowed by the pragmatics of building strong relationships with states, even when those states are run by genocidal regimes. Unresponsive to information and evidence from outside its own domain and committed to the organisational goal of comfortably working with governments no matter how brutal or reprehensible they may be, the UN at almost every level of its operations has simply failed to identify, confront and challenge genocide. Inside Myanmar, it has, as an institution, enabled genocide. Thank you.